another great presentation coming up for you here. Um, Carl Horton, I, I only knew until today through Will, and uh, Carl is, is a bit of a peripatetic implantologist, goes around, does quite a lot of work in Newtown at uh, Willie Jacksville practice, but other places as well. He qualified from Birmingham in uh, 1996, I think, and... Uh, uh, has carried on teaching there afterwards, having done MSCs in periodontology and implantology, uh, and keeps himself busy. And like Luigi, um, he his knowledge comes from his experience, and he's there um, outside of dentistry. He's still doing Ironman competitions and things like that, which uh, does make does make you worry about him. But uh, 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 he's still there, and he's. Uh, children still demand that he earns a living uh, for them. Uh, Will, I uh, got to know when we were both on the implant diploma uh, cohort five and uh, in the same tutor group and realized that we'd both been born and brought up in Cardiff, um, both loved Welsh rugby, uh, both loved skiing and cycling and uh, playing the guitar badly. And uh, we went on to teach together on that implant diploma. Um, as you can see, he takes hydration seriously. And, uh, 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 and our respective wives, Sarahs, um, uh, enjoy each other's company as well. And we're, uh, we'll be meeting up later on tonight. And uh, it's great to be able to present uh, not only a a trusted and valued colleague, but a, a great friend as well, to come and speak here. And so um, Will and Carl are going to take us through immediate full arch loading, uh, like all good double acts. They'll tag team and uh, uh, have you in stitches uh, one way or the other. So uh, thank you very much, guys. Over to you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks. Hopefully... Uh... I can do that introduction some justice. Uh, this, is, this is me, or it, it, it's partly me. So I obviously have BDS, it's not fake. Um, did an MSc in Perio, and um, stupidly, um, to try and speed up a divorce, at the same time I did an MSc in implantology before I'd actually finished the Perio. Um, she stuck with me, which is impressive, uh, despite my personality. I have done an SHO at Birmingham University, I'm a clinical lecturer for um, VSS um, at uh, UCLan, um, and I am lecturing tomorrow morning. Again, we do a little bit of distance learning on that. Um, I'm a co-director for VSS Academy. And I've got a referral service, and as Nigel said, I kind of travel around um, different practices where they have sort of an implant provision, um, working for, do a little bit for my dentist, do a little bit for other corporates and then a little bit for independent practices. Have a podcast if you're really bored and you want to listen to that. You might find some dull tones of Will and me chatting away. Um, by all means, if you want to tune into that, although I need to refresh that a little bit because it started to ramble on like I am doing now. And I'll put this other slide up. Yeah, I'm Will Murphy, I'm as uh, Nigel pointed out, from Cardiff originally, but I've been a, a naturalised Brummie um, for about the last 30-something years. So obviously I'm trying to fly the flag for Birmingham. Um, young people might not recognise that gentleman there. He's uh, quite a well-known guitarist for a, a local Birmingham band called Black Sabbath. And I'm, I'm loath to do selfies with patients, but that was just one of those moments where I thought, I need the picture with Tony Iommi, that's for sure. And then all the glamorous sights of the university and, and the rotunda. I yeah. um, started my implant journey in the late 90s um, up in Manchester, decided this was going to be my bag, and then carried on doing the uh, diploma with Nigel. Um, and then somehow, way, shape, or form or other, we ended up tutoring and lecturing on the very same course. So um, uh, that's, uh, that's my journey. Yeah. A uh, little thank you to TRICARE, uh, Dave, Phil, and Lloyd for asking us to chat with you guys today, so much appreciated. Uh, you might change your minds about that in about an hour and a half, but hopefully you won't. So the idea of today is we're going to talk a little bit about um, immediate loaded implants or full arch loading, and we're going to keep it fairly basic. We're going to go 
through some of the details. There's a lot of evidence out there, so I've just picked sort of four of the sort of the older references that it's based on. You can find many, many references, but these are these are four fairly decent ones that sort of explain the process and sort of tell you what it's all about and what it's all based on. It's been around for many years now, so we understand that it works uh, fairly well. And the kind of patients that we treat are the failing dentition, and this is sort of how they often present to us, asking us to help them out. It's important that when we look at these patients that we're having a, a full-on conversation with them. Because I've got a perio background, I'm sort of re-establishing that patient to see whether or not I think this is the right sort of treatment for them. And although the patient might think it's the right sort of treatment, we've got to help them decide and make a decision to whether it is the right sort of treatment for them. So this, this lovely gentleman, he's actually a, a retired GP, um, and he, he actually went into clinical psychology, and this is how he used to present to his patients. And he turned up to sort of ask me to help him out, and then we took him through a long process. A lot of our patients have periodontal disease, so they're often sort of stage four, grade A-ish, because it's been a sort of a slow progression to where they get to. And again, we need to make a decision as to how we help them out. We've got the BSP gradings. I've, I've popped them up there for you to have a little look at, because these really should be in our notes and how we sort of grade that process. So you can see there, grade A, it's a fairly slow rate of progression. I, I'm a little bit cautious if somebody's coming in sort of a grade B or a grade C and, and offering this kind of treatment. I'd, I'd really want a bit more of a history because sometimes these patients sort of land up on your doorstep for the first time, especially with me, because I'm a visiting service um, and I've never really seen many of these patients before. They're either new to the practice or they're long-standing in the practice when they've been nursed along. And I think it's important that you make that into your clinical notes and you understand where the patient is and how we get them through it. And then we've got what presents sometimes as remedial work. So sometimes I get patients that land on here and there's actually only three implants that are actually holding that upper bridge on and you can see the, the lower bridge there. So we have to sometimes sort of talk them through what they're sort of looking for in terms of where they are and where they're gonna to get to. And that can be quite an expensive process uh, and a very difficult conversation to have with the patients. This is all what we wish for. Um, I've had one like that. <laughs> Um, so it was just an machine. absolute, absolute beauty Looking of, up. yeah, like bone. Machine. It was like, yeah, it was like a brick of bone and, you know, all those implants. Not guided, though. Only guided by my eye. And I'm not showing off. <laughs> you are. And Yeah, I am. And then we sort of have the process of how we restore. So nice and low in complexity is removable dentures. And then as we got that complexity, we've got implant-retained dentures and then implant-supported dentures. And then we've got the, the acrylic titanium fixed hybrid, which we'll talk a little bit about. Fixed hybrid on immediate loading, and then the zirconia titanium fixed bridge, or the, the Whirly-type bridge. Um, goes up in complexity, and it also goes up in costs for your patients as well. So you, it's, it's good to understand that that uh, has a different level when you're talking to your patients, uh, when you're having those discussions about what they're gonna be doing looking after these things as well. Obviously, we are here on behalf of TRICARE, so I'm going to plug the add-in system. Uh, I'm actually going to plug the implant design, because implant design has changed over the years. So this particular type of implant, as you can see on there, I've put the image up so you can see it fairly clearly, and you can see that if my, does it work? No, it doesn't. Okay, so you can see that we've got a tapered implant with fairly aggressive threads. The implant itself, it, we know that it's going to get nice, strong stability, or hopefully. Obviously, that's dependent on the bone. We've got some micro-threading on that. So the design of the implant is important in the type of implants that we're using for this type of technique. Using sort of a parallel-sided implant, we're potentially not going to engage in the bone, and we need a certain level of torque, which we'll go through in a little bit. So implant design is important, and the add-ins produce this. They also produce the zygomatic implants as well, but Will and I aren't going to go into that in any great detail, so we're not going to be talking about zygos or pterygoids. You can ask us questions on it. And then to complement that, we have the things that go on top. So we have our angled abutments. So these come in straight. They come in 17 degrees, and they come in 30 degrees, and also 45 degrees. 45 degrees, you're probably looking more at the zygomatics. 
and it's important that you have a system that can help you with your workflow. Then you have your healing abutment, which is that little cylinder there. And that goes on top through the transition stage. So it's just keeping the tissues out of the way whilst you're waiting for your bridge to be prepared. And then you've got your little cylinder that goes on top, which sometimes your bridge is going to be fixed to. So you need a system that has all the components to help you through the process. We've got this classification. So for those of you that learn from Facebook, it's important that when they're talking about this, you understand what your FP1 is. So this is where we're replacing only the teeth and we're avoiding bone removal. So this is important if we've got a patient with a fairly high smile line and we don't want to do too much bone reduction or if that bone reduction, if we are going to do it, if that transition line is going to be lower than the lip, then the patient's going to see a difference in your prosthesis and the tissues. So it's not going to look very aesthetic. So we need to consider what type of treatment we're going to provide for the patient. So we might do something called an FP1. And then we've got what's called classified an FP2, so slightly longer cranes, we've lost a little bit of bone. Again, might be aesthetically challenging, but if the patient's acceptable for that, so we've got a little bit of the roots that we're replacing. And then FP3, so I've given you a sort of a before and after, so very first image of the patient and then the final image, and we're replacing the lots of the soft tissue, so we've got some bone removal potentially happening there. We might have already had the bone removal uh, due to natural reasons but we've got, we're replacing some of the bone and replacing some of the teeth, and usually that's going to be below the smile line. And then we'll talk about this, which is a removal prosthesis, which is implant supported. It may be on a bar. And then we've got the RP5, which is uh, the, the lower denture on some abutments. I'm moving more towards putting four of these in the lower jaw, and I think that we discussed this as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in the pub at some point. Yeah, yeah. I think it's been sort of regarded by prosthodontists as probably a minimum standard if we can achieve it, to have two implants, maybe some locators. I think what I've always found with that sort of design, and it's worth telling the patient, is that you'll still get a bit of a fulcrum effect. So I don't know if any of you guys, I can see lots of people nodding, have found that the dents are still lifting a little bit and they can still get a bit of rubbing. But obviously what you're doing is you're just getting some good, good retention. So you're losing out, you're not getting that side-to-side -side motion. So it's a really good cost-effective solution, but there are drawbacks that you have to discuss with patients. And I think the reason that we've put these on there is because when you are surfing Facebook or the literature, it, it does help if you understand what an FP1, an FP2, and an FP3 is, because although we might not always talk in those terms, it just helps us kind of classify things. And this is kind of how we discuss things in an academic sort of situation. And I think it helps you guys if you're sort of looking towards this and when somebody mentions what an FP1 is or an FP3 is, and it yeah. kind of gives you some idea of what's going on. Yeah. So if we sort of pick up on the failing dentition, um, and again, these patients are coming into us all the time, aren't they? They've been, they've been sort of kept going by ourselves or our, or our GDPs. They're reaching the end of the road. The teeth are failing. They're not going to be able to have any bridges any longer. Um, along with some people who've decided that their denture is no longer fit for purpose and they they decide they want to have a fixed option. So obviously there's differences between people who turn up with teeth and completely without teeth. And also you've got to look at the person who's attached to the teeth as well in terms of what's appropriate. I think sometimes with the way, as all things with implants, has possibly become a bit of a commodity in terms of advertising, you've still got to think, well, is this sort of one-size-fits-all approach appropriate for who's coming in to see me? So typical sort of patient who may come in, lady in her 70s, um, dentition has reached the end of the road. Fortunately, she has got some experience of wearing a partial prosthesis. So in my mind, conversion to a full prosthesis that's fixed in place should be quite a, a hopefully a nice smooth transition, as opposed to somebody who might have terrible teeth, but even terrible teeth still feel like teeth to the patient. So... Um, Again, part of the consent process is really important to make sure they understand that they're going to essentially a, a fixed denture in place, and there's a, a large bulk of acrylic that's going to be sitting in their mouth, which they need to be made very much aware of. So in this sort of case, again, typical situation, you take out teeth, you degranulate, the landscape changes, and we'll probably sort of talk about this a little bit more, won't we, as we sort of go through in terms of, you know, perhaps our classic cock-ups, which we will throw in as well. Um, so again, 
landscape changing, buckle bone gone, not totally happy with placement, but we've got enough in there that we can get some good soft tissue coverage and then move through the phases in terms of getting a, a, an immediate bridge. This is a situation where you see probably about three months later when we're sort of moving into a more definitive um, uh, prosthesis. And again, if I put five in, I won't necessarily load all five in the immediate. You know, you maybe keep it simple, maybe load four of them. Um, you might have one that you feel is a little bit iffy in terms of your stability. So there's, there's no reason not to just go with, uh, go with four. You're gonna see plenty of these, and I know some of you young people will be going, oh man, it's so, so analog, so, so out of date. And admittedly, I think we're probably moving into a phase in terms of implant dentistry and full arch where this sort of thing will probably be starting to phase out in terms of using photogrammetry. And if you've got an iMetric at a bargain price of, what are they, about 40 grand? Yeah, yeah, at the yeah. moment. One yeah. of those, so has anybody got one? No, good, not me. So uh, <laughs> until I get one, we're, we're going to be using lots of these sorts of things. I thought you were going to say, does anybody want to buy one? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Not yet. So, okay. um, you know, for, for me as well, this is probably one of the most important, important things because from that, you've got the confidence to get yourself uh, your mill bar made. And these things are very expensive. And if they don't fit, that's on you. And that's probably two grand that you'll, you'll never see again, okay? Because the patient is expecting you to be competent and provide them with a proper full arch. Now, I like these for the simple reason. Um, patients can clean them. They've got access. Um, they're nice. They're neat. They're tidy. You can see what's going on. You can take them off. You can refurb them. I tend to factor in now um, a duplicate sleeve, and we keep that in the box, maybe even a duplicate sleeve, and I'll also get it waxed up, so that sits in the box. These things take a hammering, um, they take a beating, like everything, they break down, they fracture, they chip, and at some point the whole thing's either going to need to be refurbished. So it's almost like being the quick fit fitter of, of dentistry, and they can come in, you can get them turned around nice and quickly, um, and they're still in a, in a fixed prosthesis. Um, there's sometimes a conversation to be had with this sort of design as well because patients have in their mind fixed and they've got in their mind removable. Now, although this is removable, to my mind, it's, it's pretty much a bridge. It's got advantages in terms of transition lines and things like that, but because um, some pa patients in their head are saying, oh, I don't want to be able to take it out. So sometimes I'm saying, yeah, but this is like a bridge. Don't, don't think of it like that. Just think of it as a bridge that you can maintain very easily. And if you have a problem, then we can get that sorted out nice and quickly. You. So we're going to go through diagnostics and treatment options. Any guys, do you do this kind of approach? You can <coughs> keep your hand then, Tom. Anybody else? Okay. Anybody thinking of doing this? Straight away after today, obviously. Yeah. I think it's important. There are lots of courses out there that you can go on, um, some very interesting courses. So do, do your research. I think it's important that you, uh, you select your patients very carefully. Um, and we're going to go through the assessment on the patients. So certain patients are sort of absolutely contraindicated to this, and that, that goes along with implants as well. Um, so absolute contraindications are, are listed there for you guys to have a, a little look at. Obviously, we've gone through the intravenous bisphosphonates. There are some kind of contraindications I think you need to have a conversation with your patient about and, and get them aware of it. So I'll put methotrexate up there. And so we've got lots of evidence coming through now that sort of methotrexate can be an issue with integration short and long term on patients. So I've just put up there as a, as a little one to kind of make us aware of. There's lots of patients that are on this long term and short term. Um, so you need to find out why they're on it, how long they're going to be on it for. But the difference with this one is, if it's short term, it's potentially out of our system after a certain amount of time. So a slight difference in how we deal with those patients. Smokers, again, it's a question mark. I think it's an individual decision, and Will and I have had a few conversations about this. We had a bit of a chat, didn't we, earlier yeah. today? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's what always was a... the outcome of your chat? Yeah, you, please do, yeah. I don't, I don't uh, know that we had an outcome. I think yeah, it, we, it we was... just beat each other up. Wait, wait, wait. So I, I, I kind of look at it as a patient as a whole and how invested they are. Um, with me, they, and I'm sure it's the same with Will, they go through a sort of a hygiene process as well. 
So we're sort of watching where they are as they go through the process. So they don't come in like that first image that you saw, a total mess, and then, yeah, okay, great, you, you get this. They have to show sort of a pathway to show that they're on board with the treatment and they can effectively be on board with that. And then I kind of make a judgment as to whether I feel that this patient is suitable or not. And I think if they're not ticking the first boxes on the, the fact that they can't maintain their own teeth and they might be smoking as well, then it's an absolute no for me. I'm not going to carry on with the treatment. And that's right and, from the outset. And it's how much they're smoking, because they usually lie, don't they? they they'll yeah. usually... Yeah. If they say 10, it's, it's 20. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. If, well, if it was sort of 10 years ago, then, and they've been monitored, I'm, I'm probably going to be okay with it. But if they've had one six months ago, I'm not going to pop any, do any surgical work on that. I think we're always, we're always going to be treating people for ASA2, is it sort of mild yeah. systemic disease? Is, is, you know, very hard to find somebody in that sort of 50, 70 age bracket who doesn't have something, you know, plenty of us do. So, um, I think it's beyond that then obviously. And of course then you need to be writing to their doctors or physicians and, and making sure you've got the green light because you know, okay, we're hopefully well trained, knowledgeable dentists, but they are, you know, the medical people and we can we can seek their opinion. On IV dysphosphonate, if they had IV dysphosphonate six months, ten years ago. Good question. How do you feel about that? Yeah. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because ten, 10 years, yeah. I, I, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd still be a little bit cautious about it. Uh, that's my personal That's my personal view. It's point. got quite a long... Is it cautious as in you wouldn't give it or cautious... I probably wouldn't. Yeah, it's got quite a long half-life, hasn't it? Ten and a half years. Ten and a half years. And that's the half-life. Yeah. So, yeah. so you get, So we're up in that kind of decade. So I, I think very nervous for me. Mm. And it's... Yeah, orally, orally, I'm not so worried that I am with its IVs. Mm. So I, I, I don't particularly worry too much about it. I might be a little bit more concerned if the patient's presenting with other features. So orally, smoking, they've presented with bad oral. Consent. Consent. We don't have current indemnity. Yeah. You do. <laughs> I, 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 I think there's a bit of a difference there. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Going, against, going against someone like SD said, it's a little bit more of a challenge for us. Yeah, and on a, on a similar note, I had a, a patient who had head and neck radiotherapy who needed an extraction, which I referred, even though it was quite a straightforward extraction. So that was done in a hospital setting. And I remember a few months later, he was like, oh, this doesn't seem to have healed up very well. And so, of course, he, he's got osteoradionecrosis going on now from a very, very straightforward. And once, once you see that, um, you know, you really don't want to have that on your hands in terms of management because he's to and fro, he's having it cleaned out, he's got a syringe to clean it, and I don't think they know what to do with it. Yeah, I've, I've, I've seen this place. Fortunately for me, nothing that I was doing. It was patients that had had things done. Yeah. So I'm really, I don't like it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I certainly wouldn't want to yeah, you don't, you don't want it on your hands, and I think if there's an opportunity for, you know, uh, the change, advice has changed from three years to five, so there's a bit, a bit more, yeah, uh, maneuvering going on. But yeah, yeah, I think it's where you're comfortable with. It's it's how comfortable you are having that conversation with the patient, yeah. making sure you're getting totally informed consent, and seeing where where you sort of sit with things, and where they are. It's another one, it's yeah, another really interesting one. one. Makes me twitch. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is another lecture itself. <laughs> it? Actually, it's, uh, no, it's a good question. Good and, question. You know, and, and again, you know, if I'm having a conversation with a patient and you know that there are alternatives, then I might be kind of guiding them through the process, having a conversation with them, telling them what the risks are, and maybe saying the alternatives might suit you better. Especially if, if I'm not comfortable, they, they don't get the treatment. I have to be very comfortable with everything and make sure that they're on board and they understand. So consent, consent, consent. And I'm very happy. And if, I, if I'm sort of wavering, I might sort of ring Will up and say, here, mate, I've got somebody for you to do. <laughs> so you're all right, uh, Carl. Just, okay. And then just say to the patient, just don't mention it. Yeah, much better. No, in, in all seriousness, I think it's, it's, 
a conversation you need to have with the patient and sort of see where you sit and how comfortable you are with it uh, and follow the guidelines. Yeah. Is it still one in fifty thousand? What's the current? I can't remember what the incidence is. Um, I, I can't remember off the top of my head. I can't answer that question for you. Sorry. You only need to see one, and you'll never, ever, ever you don't want to see do it, it again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Worry. yeah. Um, and then I'll pass you over to Will for a psychological evaluation, which uh, he does very, very well. Yes. Um, yeah, the, I guess the bits that you, you can't see, but you're trying to work out when the, when the patient comes in. And so obviously there's a psychological impact of, of tooth loss that patients have that sometimes, again, we don't, we're looking at the, looking at the teeth and the titanium and, and not the person who's sitting behind there. Um, and again, you know, a simple study like this just sort of highlights sometimes the expectations that, um, that patients will have, you know, when they're sitting in the chair, saying some of the things that really do sort of get you a little bit nervous, you know, in, in terms of the, there's not likely to be complications, so they last forever, do they, Doc? Um, and, you know, they're better or stronger than real teeth. Um, and so this is all part of the education process where you, you kind of have to become a sort of amateur psychologist. Um, and there's, there's questionnaires out there. I think these are on, I've seen them on different WhatsApp groups. Um, I kind of have to thank a, a local dentist around here called Paul Swanson, who does a very good lecture, um, which involves a lot of this. And I think watching him give his lecture really made me think a, a bit more about this, really, rather than, rather than just the teeth. And so these sorts of questionnaires you can use just to, um, you know, partially risk assess. I know, you know, we're not psychologists, but just to get an understanding of who's sitting in your chair and what they're expecting. My wife's a psychologist. Yeah. Absolutely. Been around. She can, Mind reader. She can do it. Mm. Um, back to expectations. I mean, again, this is something I spend a lot more time, especially when we're coming into sort of full arch treatments and, and things like that. Are you looking for a cosmetic makeover? Is this what you're here for? Because you're thinking your teeth are just going to look amazing. And we had a little discussion, and we've talked before about there's a a sort of large branded company, and they've got a few sites around the UK who, who just specialise in full arch <coughs> treatment only. And they're very amenable. You can go around, have a look at their, have a look at their sites. And what I really liked about their process, although it's super slick from a business point of view, um, they make it very clear, don't they, that this is not a cosmetic procedure. This is purely uh, functional. This is just to get you into teeth. And they do have different grades, I think, don't they? They in do, terms yeah. of, You yeah. know, you can have more aesthetic teeth, if you like, in terms of materials. But it's really, I just thought it was really good to sort of get that cleared up with your patients from the off that, listen, today's teeth that you might get at five o'clock, you know, they will not be perfect. They may feel bulky, you'll be sore, all yeah. the rest of it, but they are not there to make you look like Angelina Jolie, okay? Yeah. They, they limit the shades, so your patient gets a, a smaller shade range. Um, they limit the sort of the size of the That's teeth as I well. Anyway. It's A3, <laughs> yeah. A3 or nothing. It's A3 or nothing, yeah. yeah. One shade, is it? Yeah, yeah it's a one shade fits yeah. all. Uh, and, and, you know, it sounds like quite a sensible system, really, when you're looking at this, because what you're trying to do is restore primarily function for your patient. And when you start getting taken down that cosmetic route, this is a very difficult process to get this cosmetically right. Um, we were watching the presentation that you had earlier, and uh, this is not for that. No. Um, you do our best, obviously you're going to do your best, but there are limitations to what you can achieve um, with this. And I think also time again, <clears throat> um, you know, teeth in a day, it's all sold, there's now, now, now. But again, you need to tell your patient that, you know, you need to be here quite a lot, you know. Um, once we've done your teeth in a day or what have you, um, there's a whole load of process that's going to carry on where we monitor you, we look after you, we're going to take you through the more definitive stages, and especially if you're, you know, maybe an analog dinosaur like I am, um, it's going to be numerous visits of checking and trying and, and trying to get the right thing. Now, here's our favourite, isn't it? So the patient comes in, sits down. Um, I'm, I'm suing my last three dentists, um, and that's making the heart beat a little bit faster. You're thinking of a fee, and then you're sticking a zero on the end of it. 
And they'd probably still say yes anyway. So, um, you might have to another zero. Another zero. Just keep putting zeros on and, uh, you know, you, you give your best go away fee, don't you? And, yeah. Uh, it's always the way, isn't it? They'll say yes. So, um, again, there's lots of litigious people out there. Make sure your indemnity is all up to scratch and your consent processes are up to scratch. Um, because, yeah, sometimes the, as, you, as you least expect it, you know, those, those people are out, are out there. So I'm just going to run through some of the assessments that, uh, that Will and I do. So obviously photographs when the patient first comes in. So we're looking at sort of where that smile line sort of sits, um, how high that sort of lip line is. We'll do videos. So we'll get the patients to talk to us. We'll give them some phrases to say. So I might say just say the days of the week or the months of the year um, and just video that so I can sort of see how their lips movement. And then that gets sent to the lab. So the lab can have a, a little look and just help me with the potential phonetics. If you're feeling really fancy, there's some AI systems out there. So I've included one called Airbrush, which isn't actually designed specifically for implants. Um, it's more for orthodontics. But you can take a, a little picture on your phone of the patient. And then you put the smile in, and then you scroll across. And it'll actually do a setup of the teeth um, through artificial intelligence. You have to have a conversation with the patient and say, actually, it might not look quite like this, because remember, aesthetics can be a little bit of a challenge. But it gives them something to help them sort of envisage where they may be. Um, so it's, it's something to bear in mind when we're doing our sort of evaluations and, and what we need in our records. Sometimes I'll do a panoramic radiograph. Um, not always. There are some people that do this as routine. Um, it's not something that I tend to do as routine, but it can give you an overall sort of view of the patient. Um, maybe this is sort of from my periodontal training. Uh, I might differ to others, so I'm more of a, a periapical kind of individual, but that's, that's just me. Um, and then inter or higher. Uh, sorry, you just, um, just to I'm going to ask you a question later, but it seems good time now. When you're making an assessment of, of cases, when patients come in and they've never got, I don't know, 60% bone loss or something, or 70% bone loss, and it's one of those where okay, this patient probably will inevitably lose teeth and may need some full arch implants or whatever. If you retain the teeth for another 10, 5, 10 years, obviously you've got to gradually lose bone in the implantology. In fact, the implantology side will be harder because you'll have less bone to work with. What factors go into your decision about when to time that treatment? You know, do you, how long do you hang on for the teeth for? You know, with the view that you, what do you get question. what I'm saying? It's those I do, yeah. Uh, and this feeds into some of our cases, doesn't it? Yeah. This, this, oh, I love you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm conflicted because I have a, a periodontal head on and I have an implant head on. My wallet doesn't come into it. I don't care about that. What I care about is where the patients are. And from my point of view, if those teeth are maintainable for another five years, they're keeping the teeth. The kind of patients that I'm treating are internal dentition. So the prognosis is really poor. It's a less than five year prognosis on those teeth. If they're presenting like this radiograph, this isn't really a very good radiograph to show you, but if they're presenting and there's enough bone there to maintain those teeth and they've got sort of, I think, over five more years, as long as they're following the process. And that helps me with another factor that I'll come on to. So if they're, if they're invested in having the periodontal treatment, and we can get them through that, and we can get them to keep the teeth. I'll get them to keep the teeth every single time. I think we've all seen the um, like some videos and then some cases that go up on forums where you look at a good batch of teeth and think, mm, you know, as they've been taken out and ridges are bladed, you know. And I'm not saying right or wrong, you know, it might be appropriate to whatever, but it's that conflict that we have, isn't it? You know, especially you as a periodontist, that that's always out there, isn't it? It's a, it's a good question. And there isn't a sort of a black and white answer. And it's based sort of on the individual presentation of the patient. And I guess my sort of decision as to whether I think those teeth have got a longer than a five year prognosis. But in my mind, if I can get those patients to keep those teeth for another five years, they're going to keep the teeth. I'll always try and get them to keep the teeth. If I feel that it's a terminal dentition and it's a less than five year prognosis, for most of them, not, let's say not all of them necessarily, then we might talk about some implant options. But it has to be a 
pretty much a terminal dentition for me to consider. And your question that I'm also not answering is the potential bone loss over time. Well, hopefully, if they're undergoing the periodontal program, then that bone loss is, is slowing down. So we're monitoring them every three months, and we're checking on everything and making sure that everything is okay and that the disease is stable. And if it's stable, they shouldn't be losing any more bone, or at least a minimal amount of bone at the time. Does that answer your question? Sort of. Okay. But, and, and just to follow up on that then, suppose they've got, I don't know, advanced bone loss, particularly say three to three, and then four, five, six, as you might get five, five, ten years out of it. Would you then look to re maintain those four, five, six, and just treat the anterior section with some implants? Or would oh, absolutely. You then go for a full arch and say, well, okay, I might get another three years out of, five years out of these molar teeth. But then, you know, I could put two more implants in here. I could do the whole arch on four or five, or do we just put two or three in the front? It, it, the judgment calls, and I just wonder what. Yeah, full arch is a last resort. So if I can maintain teeth, I'll maintain teeth, and I don't know whether Will feels the same way, but if I've got some teeth that I think have a longer prognosis, I'll do exactly what you said there, and I'll take the teeth with a poor prognosis out, and then they'll get almost like a split, some teeth and some implants, with a view to what could be happening later on. So implants strategically placed that we might be using, but there's, I'll show you a little slide in a little bit that will kind of answer where we also might go with the patient. Question there, Carl. Just following up with another as you referred to, and that is with the partial extraction. So if you wear your perio cap and you remove the terminal teeth, those teeth that are remaining, you talk about good oral hygiene, well, yeah, okay, fine, but it's what's happening to the flora in the mouth, of course. Are you not exposing yourself to risk of mucositis, etc., because you're still leaving a potential nest for the bacteria to work from, whereupon if you do full clearance, top and bottom, are you not improving your, your long-term success of having some kind of fixed restoration for the patient? Well, if they can't maintain their teeth, then they're unlikely to maintain a full arch but implant you know, bridge. In, you, but you were talking about susceptibility and so forth mm. and so on. The question is, does this genetic sensitivity carry through into implants or is it purely down to natural yes. teeth? So the same, the same bugs that will affect your teeth will affect your implants. And but you've removed all the teeth, so consequently haven't that bacterial flora changed? Not necessarily, no. They can, they can still develop around implants, okay? So you can still get aggressive um, uh, inflammation because the inflammation is sort of part of your host response. So patients have that host response in them where neutrophils are sent up to attack you know, the bacteria and they're pretty indiscriminate, aren't they? they? They're kind of going for whatever's around and unfortunately, people who are more susceptible, they're taking out the bone as well. So I, I think people who are, in my book, periodontally susceptible, I have to say you, know, you are susceptible to you know, peri-implantitis as well. You, in that Would that kind of, change your approach to a more simplistic kind of attitude to make it even more simpler for the patient rather than going for fixed and, and you know beautiful ceramic work and everything but it's a real bucket to keep clean mm -hmm. would that influence your, your your treatment planning might influence the design yes uh, so that and the oral hygiene techniques have to be brought up to a level and then there's some things like water picks and you know some of the some of um, interproximal techniques that we're pushing onto the patient so that hygiene process isn't just to get their teeth up to scratch, it's to show that they can actually maintain the bridge design that we're producing as well. So they'll have hygiene pre-bridge and then hygiene post-bridge to make sure that everything is up to scratch to get everything and maintain everything. So they get, with mine, and it could be the same with Will's, they're, they're seen every three months post-fit to make sure that everything is okay and then we start to change that slightly if later they, on. If they yeah. Thank you very much. Did I answer your question completely? I feel like I'm missing it. Which is good. <laughs> okay. So you did answer your question, my question. Thank you. Okay. Do you weigh into this sinus pneumatization? Because if you're keeping teeth, teeth are being lost on one side, that sinus is creeping across to the midline, and you're thinking, if I leave this later on, he's not going to have posterior teeth, when they have no posteriors. If I, if I maintain the teeth, I'm going to sacrifice the bone. Um, does that ever come into your picture to think maybe it's not just about your wallet, it's also about their wallet? Yeah, yeah. In terms of what they're going to get later on? Yeah, I mean, 
the, the fact that the in implants are tilted, if they've got a decent amount of bone, we've got time, then you know, that, might, that might come in. Um, depends on what limit they're at. Um, so it might be a very small factor um, that might lead into a decision and a conversation with the patient. But ultimately, the decision lies on, on them being fully informed. So I have a very simplistic conversation and make a decision again. And if I, if I sort of am struggling, I would start with it. No, it doesn't. I don't know. Being flippant. But, um, so there's a, there's a sort of decision tree and a decision process to go through and then a conversation with the patient and to see where you are with the patient. And if sort of A plus B plus C plus D plus E plus F, mm. and then yes or I no. I guess what I'm trying to get at, it's not always easy. But no. It is, because sometimes you think, you know what, it's going to be so much easier if I give you an oral thought at this point, even yes. I don't want to, because if I don't later on, <coughs> This this ties into a, another case, so we'll we'll push on and we'll um, yeah. it'll it'll hopefully answer yeah. exactly that. Good, point. good questions. Good questions. Yeah. <laughs> so this is my new baby. This is my new toy. So this is the sure. yeah I know. This is the the triage. What have you got? I've got the one with the wire. The okay. nurse holds the yeah. thing. I've got triage three. If anybody wants away. to buy triage three, come and see me later. Um, so this is, uh, I'm not joking, this is, uh, <laughs> we can talk about that. So this is the, the Trios 5, uh, this is beautiful, this is a wireless um, intraoral scanner, so we do an intraoral scan and obviously it replaces the impressions, gives us uh, an indication of what the patient's presenting with. We can do uh, a CBCT, I've put the stent in brackets there because if there are missing teeth sometimes we'll get a, a little stent made. Often, when we are doing the CBCT, we'll get them to bite down on some occluding paste as well, so the teeth are in the correct position and we've got uh, a little bit of occlusion present there. Um, that's sort of sent to the lab, so we'll send the scan to the lab and, and the CBCT, and I'm probably jumping ahead, so I'll jump back a little bit, but we'll get a diagnostic build-up made, and then uh, the technician and me will sort of discuss this and, and see where we sort of are. But this has sort of been made on the premise that we've gone through um, the plan where the implants are going to go, so it's not just produced. And then uh, I don't particularly use these. I don't know whether you use no. these. Uh, we've got these extra scanners um, which can scan the patient's profile and, and smile line and speech. Um, so it's another little tool that's available for us to use if we feel that we, we wish to. And then we've got the material options. There are various materials out there. So for the provisional point of view, what we're looking at is acrylic for one of the provisional types, and we can bond our um, abutments on with Q resin, or a cylinder, should I say, sorry. We've got PMMA, and then we can use composite to bond that on, uh, something called Twinny, and that does our initial pickup, and then when the patient comes back, after everything is healed and settled down, and the tissues are all lovely and healthy, and your implants are all fantastic, then we can look at what we're gonna do with the final. So you would have had a discussion at the beginning about what your final bridge is going to be based on and your costs and what the patient's looking for. So you can have something with acrylic titanium, which looks really good, uh, it looks really nice. If you want to take it up a level, you can, we looked at that sort of pyramid earlier on, you can go up to zirconia titanium. And then because, uh, well not quite there yet, can, zirconia on tie bases, which, is, which looks beautiful. And then my favorite, uh, again, from a recovery point of view and a perio point of view are sort of splitting the bridges. So we've got sort of full arch, but we've got sectional bridges across. So if ever there's an issue, you can just take one of the bridges off and fix it and then put it back on again. So it's, it's, it's much more backward compatible, if you like. And then sort of, sort of just going to run through this. Fair, are we doing for time? Are we doing okay? Yeah. So treatment planning. So we've taken our sort of CBCT and we're planning through the patient. We're taking our, working our case up. So we've got our intraoral scan with that lovely Trios 3 that you're all going to buy off me. And then we can do, if you've got the, the right software, you can actually do an occlusion with the scan as well. So I talked a little bit about getting some bite reg pace when you're doing the CBCT. But these days, some of the scanning software will actually do your bite reg for you. It depends on the type of scanner that you have. And again, it depends on what the lab can do with you as well. So you're either going digital and analog, or you're going totally digital. Um, so it depends on what kind of workup that you're sort of looking for. And then 
This is Blue Sky Plan, but you've got co-diagnostics, uh, and then you've got the TRIOS software as well, which will sort of help you sort of plan where your implants are going to go. So if you do pass this over to the technician, it needs to come back to you for you to sign off. So I don't leave this down to the technician to put the implants where the technician feels the implants should go. You need to decide where your implants are going to go. And then when you've virtually put your implants in and your cylinders on, then you and the technician can design what your prosthesis is going to look like. And then they can sort of help you out with the next stage. They can do the mock-up. This is what it might look like after you've extracted all the teeth. And then you can design a stent if you wish. So this happens to be a three shape. That's not necessarily any one that I've ever used. It's one off that website but it just shows you the kind of guide that they produce and, and how that sort of works. Uh, and it looks pretty. Apart from looking pretty, it actually is exactly the same as all the other software that's out there. Um, so it depends on whether you like the look of things or whether you like the fact that the other software does exactly the same job for a fraction of the cost. But I, I think, say that. Um, yeah. back to that slide, I think we had a brief chat, didn't we, about people getting into this digital planning and guide, thinking that the guide is gonna do it for you and the complexities of sometimes even reflecting a flap in a full arch case, which I think we've both, I'm glad you said it as well, because it was like, yeah, yeah. sometimes this is, I'm still an hour in and I'm reflecting yeah. and taking teeth out and you know, the landscape is changing in front of me. Um, so I think even using these sorts of guides, you still need a sort of reasonable amount of experience, don't you? Yeah. In terms of your, you know, your surgical handling of soft tissues and appreciation of what, you, what you've got. tell your technician I'm going to remove either if you're very aggressive down to the apices of the extraction sockets which I see some people do and they end up with tabletops to others that don't do any at all so assume the, the working with your lab and explain to him before otherwise if this thing won't fit if you've altered the topography of the bone those three pins there won't be bone there to pin them to and so it will change great question so the process would be is that the guide is sort of planned on what you're going to do. So I'll show you a little slide in a little bit. You're slightly ahead of... Uh, Sorry. Well, no, no, don't apologise. It's great. So you're slightly ahead of where we are. With an FP1, just to reiterate again, with an FP1, what you wouldn't do is you, you probably wouldn't remove much bone on FP1. You'd leave, you'd leave that where that is. But with an FP3, then you're probably taking quite a lot of bone away. Um, and this particular guide here with those little pins going in, it potentially might not, that one, the way that that looks, I don't think they've removed any bone, they've just put a guide and some pins in. With the other guides, and I'll show you a slide in a little bit, uh, sort of like a stack system, uh, where you've got one stack that you put on, and then you remove the bone, and then another one. But I'll show you that one. Thank you. I think it's you. I think it's you. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, sorry, you can do a picture if you like. Yeah, that's fine. You can right. do it. You're good at it. So, so protocols and what we've got, as I mentioned a little bit earlier on, we've got the, the digital records overlaid with the, the smart line where the implants um, may go. So you've got an idea of, of what your potential implant placement is going to be. Um, again, it kind of answers your question very slightly. Um, so you might have decided that you're going to do an open stent. Uh, in which case, basically, your implants have got to fit into... Um, <coughs> so... Am I getting a little arrow on there? Are you getting anything or nothing? No, so, okay. So you've got, essentially, uh, those little holes on your top left, uh, and that's sort of a free <coughs> reign for where your implants are going to go. Um, this is nice, because the bone doesn't always do what you expect it to do, and it's not always sort of preferable for your implants. You might find it's a little bit too soft, so you might have to move your implant position very slightly. So it allows you to sort of have some freedom uh, within a limit of to where your implants can be placed. The one in the middle, that's a pilot guided one, um, and you can see what the technician has designed there is something to go onto the pallet just to keep it fairly seated, and then they've left two little teeth on and it sits over the top. 
uh, still a little bit of room for an accuracy that can move, especially if you've moved the tissues off the pallet and especially if you've got some mobile teeth at the front. So again, you have to use your brain a little bit and take some radiographs whilst you do your pilot because sometimes you're only using the pilot and then you might be putting your implant in. So you've got to be a little bit careful with this particular type of guide so it's still prone to error. Uh, and then you've got your fully guided um, technique and then you've got your stacked guide, which is the one at the bottom. So a little bit of what you were sort of mentioning there. Is that from uh, Ireland? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the chrome system, that is. Um, yeah, so nice, I think, probably lovely for FP1s where you're not taking a lot of bone off. I think nice, maybe FP2s as well. Kind of worries me a little bit with the FP3 where you're removing lots of bone, but you know, maybe that's just my personal viewpoint. So to explain what happens with the stack guide is the tissues have been reflected. If it's will, you're two hours in, three, three hours in. <laughs> so sometimes that can be the hardest part. It can be a real struggle to get those tissues nice and reflected. And if you're sedating your patient, which we often do, it can be very difficult, especially if you've got one like that chap that we talked about where the sedation goes the opposite way and he likes to talk to me about his football team and all this sort of stuff. So they can become a little bit more agitated. So you need to be aware of that. And you pop your sort of stacked guide over the top so you haven't done any bone removal at this point and then the pins go in. So you've got this first line of chrome effectively and then bone jutting out above it where the teeth used to be. And then you drill that down to a flat level and then you put your next stack of the guide on top of that and then the little pins go and lock that in and then you've got your guide of where your implants go in. So it's, that's why it's called a stack guide. And then you do a pickup and we'll go through this again in a little bit once that's been removed and then your sort of bridge is essentially been made pretty much for you already and that comes along and you do a little bit of titivating on the bridge, locate it and then glue it in. So it's, it's a good system, it's a nice system, it has its limitations but it works very well, well from what I've seen. I haven't used it yet, uh, James is trying to push me to use it but um, I just haven't had the right case. Very careful extraction technique so you want to keep as much bone as possible and nice curette of the sockets so you're getting rid of all of that granulation tissue if it's there but again being careful around those APC you know I don't need to tell you how to take teeth out uh, and then you can see there um, a little pilot guided uh, guide sitting in the patient's mouth and what I sometimes worry about these is the movement on them so I'll take a radiograph just to check just to make sure my implants are where I expect them to be so they're not they're not as rigid as the chrome guide might be. Uh, pencils, uh, which are not fresh from the stationery, they've been autoclaved, um, and get them nice and sharp, and then you can draw some lines on once you've reflected. So this will guide you to where your implants are going to be, put some landmarks on, where the center line is, uh, and it just helps you sort of, because once you've lifted that flap away, and you've lost all your landmarks, if you're not using that chrome system, you can kind of get slightly lost sometimes. And so in my surgery, and I'm not sure it's the same with Wills, what I've got on a big screen is the, the CBCT and the plan. And then sometimes I will just print out some little diagrams of where I'm expecting the implants to go. So they're all laid down. And it just helps me sort of focus a little bit because I can lose a little bit of orientation sometimes because I'm thinking about what I'm having for tea or something like that. Yeah. And it's just sort of helping me sort of maintain and understand where the landmarks are and, and where I'm planning. So it's all sort of there visually. I can look at it. I know Martin does the same as well. <clears throat> um, this, for me, is a um, nice, cheap and cheerful acrylic burr, but it hasn't been used on acrylic, and it never will be used on acrylic unless somebody goes in and does it when I'm not looking and opens up the surgical pack, so it stays in my clues, surgical pack. If you have to blow the acrylic <laughs> off the... <laughs> yeah. Before you use it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Put that one down, get a new one. Do I? He's not here, so I can't talk about Prem. But uh, do you know where their Prem is? Do you know where Prem is? Why not? Uh, but it's, a, it's an old student of mine that uh, was easing a denture um, and then went <laughs> into the patient's face. Uh, he don't mind me telling that story. And uh, I just went, oh. come here, Prem. And he just went, what, what have I done? I went, mm, no, 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 let's have a little chat. Uh, I wouldn't let him anywhere near these birds. Um, so again, what we're doing is contouring that ridge. And it's important that we're not just, we're not just sort of flat, flattening that ridge. We're getting a, sort of a, a slight concavity on that ridge form, very slight. If you have a, a totally flat ridge, which I guess might be acceptable, you do see it, um, then you've got to think about the appliance that's going to sit on top of that. So if we can get a nice little concavity on there, then it's going to make it a little bit more cleansable uh, for the patient convexity. rather than just flat. Sorry? Convexity. Thank you. Yeah, convexity. Did I say concavity? 
Yeah, that way on the ridge and that way on the appliance. I was worried I'd be doing it wrong. <laughs> no, you've been doing it right. You've been doing it right. Uh, and, and these birds, high speed, so, you know, 2,000 plus, uh, lots of irrigation. Don't run them dry because you will necrose the bone. Uh, and then keep them moving. So keep them moving across the ridge. So I mentioned a little bit earlier on about under-preparing the site. So it's not like conventional implants. You're under-prepping that site. So you might go one size, maybe one and a half sizes down. What I mean by one and a half sizes is you might drill to depth on your first drill, and then you might go halfway or a third of the way on the second. You get a feel for the bone. So you kind of feel how that bone's sort of responding to your treatment. And we know there's all different types of bone. I guess, I'm guessing you all place implants. Yeah, stupid question, I guess. I know the uh, bone sets the tone. Yeah. Quote, uh, yeah. Tatum, but um, what, what are your own concepts about placing the implants in the pre-existing sockets? Or do you try and go for the interosseous bone? Depends on the case. So as long as everything's nice and clean, if there's been a huge amount of infection, I'm not going to put an implant into a socket where there's a huge amount of infection. But sometimes the, the socket might be the ideal place for the implant. So I kind of looked at the plan and had a look and, yeah. So if, again, if I'm going into a socket, I'm going quite deep yeah. because any laminar dura is going to disappear. I mean, that's just basic bone physiology. And I, I will add a little bit of a, a biomaterial. From Trike, I think. Yeah, Genos. Yeah. Um, uh, just to get you a bit of support. And um, probably more palatal as well these days, because again, with some historical cases where I found I've placed them too buckly, I'm getting soft tissue dehiscences, and it's just not nice to look at years later, and then you're having to manage another issue for the patient. But then if you do that, you're not left going back to my colleague at the front here with, uh, with your convexity of bone between. So you've got your implant sitting down there and, and then you've got this interosseous bone from where the, between the sockets. Do you then feel you need to, to bring that down to, to implant level? Oh, so occasionally I have. Yeah. And what I also have, and you'll see a little picture later on, is different size abutments. Different heights on the abutments. So you turn your bone level to, uh, to, yeah. uh, to transmucosal. So I, I, I uh, well, I'll show you a slide in a little bit that will kind of tell you what I do. Because I guess you don't want to lose the bone if you don't need to. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So um, I've put adaptive protocol because that's what I'm doing. I'm adapting to the bone and that's what we were talking about as well. So we're not, we're not just fixed on, on one protocol. The talk we're aiming sort of uh, 45, 50 upper limit. I, I've seen some people say they go above that, but what you've got to remember is that the internal connection on that implant or the implant itself, it, it's titanium. Titanium, it's not rock solid. It will deform if you go above a certain torque, and which means that your internal connection over time could come loose. And it might not, you might not know that, you might not be aware because everything's splintered together. So you need to be a, a, a little bit careful when you read about these people going in at talks above that. You can also necrose the bone as well. So over-talking it for me is, uh, I just don't do it. I'm, I'm sort of prepping up so that I get some kind of talk around about 45 to 50 on the happy. Sometimes it's lower than that. If it's, if it's really low, then I might just sleep that particular implant, which is what Will mentioned earlier on. So we might put six implants in. One of them doesn't feel like it's going up to 40, 45, and not even to 30. And that might be the one that I choose to sleep. When I mean sleep, it just doesn't go onto the appliance. Making sure that the abutments, when they go on top, they're fully seated. So if we're tilting these implants at the back, it means the distal part of the implant is into bone. So when you've prepped your site, you can get your handpiece before you put your implant in and take a little bit of that distal bone away. Or well, there's actually little special tools that will sit in the implant and they'll ream the bone away and they won't damage the neck of the implant because that's tanning it to itself. So there's various ways of making sure that that abutment is going to sit on and it's going to be locked into position because if the bone is in the way, you can talk it up and you're going up to 35 and it'll feel like it's nice and solid, but actually there's a gap between your abutment and the bone. And then what that's going to do is that's going to move and then your bridge is potentially going to move so the patient functions on it and your implant is not going to integrate. So when you come to do your final bridge, you'll find it's all on three, not all on four, which is a little bit frustrating. You take an x-ray to check. No, take a PA yeah, to check. So, yeah. Yeah, but sometimes it's not always easy. Yeah. But yes, yeah, yeah um, I will. This is um, one little tool that we use. So this is the, uh, the ISQ from Ostel. Um, this is the nice one because you can, you're not connected to a wire, but there's the one with the machine if you like. 
Um, and then you can measure your, your implant stability quotient. And we're looking for something, I don't know if you can see that really clearly, but you're looking for something sort of above 65, going up to 70. And you put your little peg in the implant, uh, and then you take this and you put it sort of mesio distally orientation in there and bucolingually. And it'll give you a little reading at the bottom and it'll tell you where you are on that and it'll smile at you and you'll be all lovely and happy because you've got a nice solid implant with lots of bone around it and you're happy, the patient's happy, the nurse is singing and dancing, confetti comes down from the ceiling, it's, it's all fantastic. So do you ever go in at a height or say for example, you have in there and then you check that measurement and that's been lower than you thought, has that ever happened? Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, because it's, it's kind of measuring what they call the stiffness of the implant. Yeah. So it's kind of measuring the bone around the implant. So it's kind of like little magnetic resonance around the implant. So sometimes from a, from a buccal point of view, you might not have as much bone as you like. And then I think it's kind of like a clinical decision as to whether or not you wish. So there has been one or two where I've just thought, mm, you know, it feels okay to me. I'm going to put an abutment on it. And then there's been several that I've just slept. And when I say Even though sleep. you've had a good talk on those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So again, it comes down to where you are within the situation and you know, sort of how you feel about it. I wish there was a black and white answer to all of this, but sometimes it's kind of like a little bit of sort of gut feeling and experience. So and have you been using the OSCO routinely with your... All, all, all of the cases. Right. All of the cases. So I originally had the, the really sad one, because I'm a little bit of a geek. So I had the really sad one that was wired yeah. on the little machine, but now we've got the portable one. Got and I, I love the portable one, it just makes life a little easier. Um, so, so, you know, I've got the Trios 5. That's, I'm just particularly... Yeah, I... Uh, Simple question, but usually in the Oscar, you say that something's acceptable, above 65, is great. Yeah. Is it 100? I've never got it to 100. No, I've never got it. No, I've got it to 96, I think, but I've, ne I've never got it to 100. I'm assuming 100 is the top level. Yeah, 100 has got to be cement, hasn't it? It's got to be, you know, corpse with bone all the way. And then your implant's going to fail because there's no blood supply. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I've not, I wonder if it explodes when you do that, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we talked a little bit about sort of abutments uh, and having the abutments ready. So this sort of might be a case. And everything is sort of all out and ready and planned. But what you can't see outside of that picture are all the range of abutments that we've got ready and prepared. So we've got... 30 and 17 degrees, I don't know whether you can read them on that slide, and then you've got your cylinders at the bottom. We've got more cylinders and we've got more abutments at different angles and different abutment heights. So, you know, this, this makes Dave very happy because we're ordering above and beyond what we're going to do for the case, and they are ready to pull out just in case things change. So you mentioned about the implant going in a little deeper, so we might need a larger height on the abutment, so rather than three millimetres, we might need four millimetres. So it's good to plan that things aren't going to go as you expect. So you've got something that you can pick out and it's not all going to go wrong. <coughs> and then this... Does that do a case? Do they give you a full box of stuff in case you need other bits? And they, do, they do now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can be arranged. The case, the case, I know the <coughs> company you're talking about that does the case. And I, I tend to find just sort of understanding where I am with a patient and where I might be out of the range... Uh, works for me really nicely. Um, and then they sit in a, in a little box that I've kind of decided that I'm going to use myself, so they're there and ready for me. Um, I, guess, I guess you could talk and see whether or not I do a case, but I think just pre-plan everything and, and get everything right. Um, and if, if you don't use it, save for the next case that you're going to get. Uh, this is uh, a lovely little thing um, that I find really useful for making sure that the abutments are talked down. It helps you reach at the back of the mouth because sometimes Will's got really fat fingers. Um, My chubby so, fingers, yeah. We've, yeah. Um, we were, again, this sort of highlighted the fact, you know, when a, if you're doing a, a case like this and you've got somebody under sedation who's throwing up, getting leery, and you've got a tiny little abutment and you're trying to... Again, in my case, get fat fingers in to get that distal TMA in position and screw it. You know, you're just thinking, don't drop it, don't drop it. Whereas if you've got little tools like this, sometimes I'll use a, like a handpiece set on, you know, very low torque and 15 to do a similar thing, just to sort of help you get your fat fingers out of the way and, and get that sort of torqued in at the back. To reach those hard to reach places. This is a, a lovely bowl of porridge that... Um, that the patient will need because it's good that they have breakfast before they come into this. Um, 
So they, these are the products um, that we use. So you've got osteobile, you've got the genus granules, and I'm sure you're going to have a conversation about GTO uh, a little bit later on. Um, I have this ready because you'll see sometimes that these are marketed as a non-grafting procedure. But often I am grafting a little bit, so I like a little bit of material around so that I can just help the patient a little bit. Sometimes those threads are exposed. And I, I sort of find that that's more common than it isn't. So often I'm using a little bit of material, whatever material might be, um, I might have chosen to use. I'm, I'm more of a, a GTO fan. I think you're more of a granulation fan, but you know that's just our personalities, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and then once everything's pretty much suited up, not always completely suited up, we might put the little copings on um, and then have a, a little look. And then we've got that original stent, if you remember, we take it back, or I've had to get the lab to make me one, so I can have a little look at that, and I can see where everything sort of sits. And if it's a disaster, and they're outside of that window, then the abutment's got to come off, the abutment's got to be changed, or the implant's got to be moved very slightly so that we're back into that window, because otherwise you're bulking up that restoration and you're making it very difficult for the patient to maintain it long term. And then, depending on what type of technique you're going for, this is sort of an older kind of way that I used to do it. This is the rubber dam popped onto the temporary cylinders, and then I might do a pickup with acrylic. And then more often than not, I'm doing a PMME pickup these days, so the lab have sort of processed that. And as long as I've put the implants in the right place, hopefully everything's been okay, the cylinders have gone on. And then I'm doing a pickup with one of these products. So I mentioned it earlier, so 20 for me for the PMMA, and then Q resin for the acrylic. Um, and then this is Danny from DSD. I promised him I'd give him a shout out. Very, very shy. We'll then give him that. He'll disappear off, and uh, I'll tell him off with his uh, absolute atrocious mask wearing. And he will then convert that into the final sort of first bridge, provisional bridge for us. And then we'll fit that, and um, it all looks absolutely wonderful and lovely. Um, and then we go from, from that to that. And it looks like it's on a quite a slight slant to me, but hey. That's just a head. That's just a head. Yeah, and then hopefully when you get to the review, you don't look like me when I do park run um, with my son on fancy dress day. It's not disturbing at all. And they're coming, there, coming in really happy. And they come in looking like that top left picture where everything is looking wonderful and nice and clean. And although he was doing an adequate job in the, the bottom right, he wasn't really cleaning his bridge as much as I would have liked. Lots of sort of hyperplasia around. And so he went through another process with the hygienist uh, just to bring him up to scratch a little bit before we went on to the final. Then there's various ways that we can verify this going on to the second stage. So there we're just linking everything up with a little bit of gloss. Uh, the lab will then send me back um, sort of a registration, if you like. So that's what the lab will send me back. That's then linked up and, and fitted down. And that should fit passively. So everything should just fit down really nicely. I shouldn't have to find the screws going <coughs> like that. If it doesn't fit down, then split it and link it back up again. So the lab understand that I can only count to four. So they've written the numbers on for me and told me which implant is which. And then I'll, I'll relink it and re-verify it. And then there are various ways that you can do your occlusal registration. So these are just some little techniques where you have a little button that will sit on your abutment, and you can screw those on. And then you've got your two little inserts there, uh, a little bit like the way that the overdentures work, and that just clips in. And then you can do a bite reg over the top of that. Or you can get a total wax up, uh, like you can see on the right, and then you can get that to fit down. Although if you look really carefully, you'll see that uh, the patient uh, bit down lovely and hard on that and actually fractured it. So there are, there are ways of doing this, various ways of doing it. And then when you fit your final bridge, hopefully you'll get something uh, looking like that. So that's the FP3 case. Uh, it doesn't, I would love you to have seen the fit surface on that. So you've got that nice fit surface against those tissues, so it's nice and cleansable. Um, and, then, and a very happy patient, although I wasn't too chuffed with her oral hygiene on the lower, so she's gone through some oral hygiene. Uh, and then I think I'm going to pass you over to Will, because I've been rambling on for far too long, as always. Yeah, so again, I'll sort of whiz through, because it's not one size fits all. So again, you're getting confronted by people and their lives and everything that happens around them. And that's, that's got to play a part in the type of treatment that you're doing for them. So, OK. Temporization, not my number one concern, it's probably slightly flippant, but it's, it's certainly something that you, you have to pay great attention to. Um, example of a patient, so you look at the age, 
and think, okay, this patient hopefully is going to live into their 80s plus. You're going to be providing some form of implant treatment, and you know, well, what are you going to leave that patient with? If they're in their 40s, do they want to have a plastic denture that's screwed in? And then what happens in 10, 20 years' time when this fails? They need other bites of the cherry. So you've got to look at the patient and see what's appropriate. This patient, again, happened to be a, a university lecturer. Obviously, perio case, well-maintained, bought into the whole thing. Again, risk, like we talked about before. Um, so the thought process is, right, we've got to lead this prosthetically. She's going to have her pink aesthetics. We don't really want her to be having um, plastic on show um, and have, providing an all-on-four, which she was quoted for as well, just seemed totally inappropriate to me. Add on to that, gag reflex. So, again, you can't always do it in a day. Sometimes you do have to go the long or the long, long way round. So we pick out four teeth that we think might survive a transitional process, we'll just prep them, We'll get a temporary acrylic bridge. That gives us a nice bit of breathing space where we can place implants. We can allow for soft tissue, shrinkage, and then we can start moving through other phases. You come to a, a point at which you're going to uncover your implants. And with this one, I decided then I would transition her into implant-supported immediate bridges. Okay. So again, because of the gag reflex, um, I don't like closed tray impressions, but again, analog, and now this, this will all be superseded digitally um, before you know it. But for this case, it was literally a case of mixing up the putty, putting it in as quickly as you can, everybody backing off, getting out of the way before she throws up. Peeling abutments in, and again, temporary bridges being made uh, by the lab. Again, metal acrylic. I've scored an own goal because what I should have done is I should have practiced what I preached. I should have had a passivity jig made to go around the teeth, and um, I didn't, okay? So what I ended up with was abutments in place. You can see from the previous slide, I usually get duplicates made. Again, it may cost you 50 quid extra for each one, but it's worth it, factor that in. A bit like the duplicate sleeves, it's always good to have that in the box. And also it just means when you're trying things in and out, you've got your definitive abutments in place and you don't need to be taking them in and out, which the soft tissues don't like. So own goal, fit the bridge, terrible cant, it's very long, patient hates it, she hates me, and I spend the next 45 minutes trying to make up a chair side acrylic bridge, putting the uh, center line right. At the same time, she's very happy now. Patients in the waiting room obviously now hate me, and we've got our catalogue of patients getting very upset. But we've managed to just about rescue that. Back to the lab, and we get the three uh, temporary metal acrylic bridges made. They're a bit blocky, but we're, we're getting back on, on track now. We're starting, to, we're starting to win. You can use these bridges as well with the right pontic shapes to start to mould your soft tissues. And get yourself in a position where you can start thinking about moving forward onto your definitives. Again, Carl says he likes these split bridges, as I do, because you can do very crude um, bite registrations. You can then put that bridge back on, take the next one off, do a bite reg, and you can end up with a nice um, format registration. You can then also use these um, little locators. Again, just use that simply as a pickup impression so we can pick up the soft tissues. So again, you get your, your shiny porcelain. You've got a reasonable um, pink-white balance. Again, to her, again, university lecturer, she's in her early 40s, it's going to feel a bit more like natural teeth rather than something that's very heavily made up with acrylic and, and probably, again, just feels like a, a screw indenture. So starting point, end point. You're never going to get unless you're Ricardo Kern or someone, um, absolute papilla regeneration. Um, so, you know, the usual long contact points, but again, a sort of reasonable result. Doesn't all have to be uh, complex. It could be sort of more simple prosthetic. So patients will turn up where they're already edentulous, provides another problem for you, because at least when people have teeth and they come out, there's probably some bone to work with. Somebody who's been in a denture for a long period of time you talked about enlarged sinuses, so you can see AP spread is fairly minimal here. 
Again, we've gone through the processes of um, uh, picking up impressions. The way I tend to do it with a case like this is obviously verification jig. Cut it, pick it up again if it's not quite right. I think prosthodontists tell me that's far too big a gap and it should be one micron or something. Um, you can also have your denture made up in advance. And then I'll just take a wash impression, use that reseated with the uh, bite registration, and then the technician can locate that onto the model. And again, a little bit of sort of distalization with a cantilever on the bar. Again, you've got to check these things because those bars are still, you know, your Createch type things, which will still probably cost you a couple of grand. So make sure that's all, all factored in and make sure it's accurate. And then in terms of the prosthesis, you know, fairly simple uh, acrylics, cost effective. Uh, word to the wise, again, always put a little chrome strengthener in there as well. These things get a bit of a beating. Um, I've started stretching them more onto the palette again. I think I'm, I'm, I'm always looking for a bit more strength from them because if you try and get too clever and cut them down, you probably find they start um, uh, start cracking. Until you get the dentate in, you never know what the proxism status was before. Well, you yep. usually find out, don't you? Absolutely. Yep. <coughs> don't be worried about it, don't you just get yeah. It's just easier. Yeah. I, th I, I think that's... Whenever and just tell them that when one's been repaired, you can have the other. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think it's, it's very wise now, and I think you can see the people with experience, because tell us how we know, because we have been in those situations where things are broken, whereas now it's, it's nice to know, you know, quick fit fitter, there's one in the cupboard, away you go, we're all good. Um, with these sorts of full arch cases, again, there's a, there's a level of trust, and, and trust is a two-way street, you know, take it for granted, they're coming to trust you, but at the same time, you need to trust the patient because there's a reason why they obviously got in this situation in the first place. And so you need to keep that in the back of your mind. Um, and unfortunately, in, in this sort of case, probably a level of arrogance got over me. I thought, oh, yes, I can do one of these full arch cases and it'll be, it'll be dead easy. Um, everything about it was hard. It was horrible. The bone was horrible. The granulation tissue was horrible. The implant placement didn't feel very good. He had a spare implant there, which I thought I'd leave in place. Um, and just everything down the line just went horribly wrong. His soft tissue healing was pretty nasty, as you can see in that middle slide. I tried my best with a, like Carl talked about, a nice ovate underside, keep it nice and clean and hygienic. Um, and then, of course, um, an all on four became an all on three. Um, which he wasn't very happy with. I could have messed up that transition line very easily. Um, probably didn't give that enough thought in my planning. So fortunately, again, that's his biggest, widest smile. Um, so we, it set us back quite a way, but it's just a sort of every now and again, a sort of lesson, lesson learned from just thinking you can fly into these things and it'll all go like clockwork. Jeremy Sanson, in these cases, I mean, years ago, I did a manual course, and they were showing you how to put more in, how to use the biomechanics. You could end up getting more forces in the distal implants, so you're not actually making things last longer. That was his, his thing. But when you see all on four, you think, I wish I had another one. <laughs> because once you've got all on three, you're not going to stay in all on three, you're going to have to remake the whole thing. And how do you feel about actually doing all on four versus all on six or all on five? Um, to, can I ask a question? Is that okay? Was he looking at pterygoids or with zygomatics? No, no, or he was no, just looking no. at six this in was, this, um, this, this was pure, in, in... Uh, you know, up, up to this six area. Okay. And he was showing the, the actual physics behind it. And the physics were you're not actually uh, improving the biomechanics by having more implants, you're going to get more bone loss. Because you're moving the forces of the fulcrum forwards, and he was showing he was showing the physics of it with a, a, a math equation, so he's proving it. Yeah, I haven't seen that. Was he proving it clinically or proving it mathematically? Just out of curiosity. Math mathematically, <laughs> he's saying this is what's going to happen. Yeah. You know, you, you, you're, you know, our fulcrum works. It's this time. You know, F, F is this times this. Here you go. This is what's going to happen, and they showed finite elements. So he's, you know, uh, to show that is the proof. This is what it is. Uh, I think. Because someone put their hand up, yeah. you know, and they said, you know, I do all six, you know, and Palomella's answer to that was, well, that's great that you do that, you know, I wish I could have an 18-year-old wife, but I don't, you know, so, 
Yeah, probably shouldn't actually. <laughs> um, I think I don't know to answer your question in all honesty. I have not seen any evidence um, behind all on six being any worse than all on four. My worry is the problem that we get with potential failures. So when there's enough bone for six, um, in my, my logical brain says the distribution of the forces on six is going to be better than four. And in terms of moving that fulcrum slightly away from those front ones, moving it onto some implants and pivoting on the implants so it's more distal and more... That may, the AP spread makes sense to me if we're doing that. Um, but then I guess the argument could be that those distal implants are in softer bone. Um, I'm, if I can put six in, I'll put six in. And if the patient can afford six then six will go in. Are you going to ask me a question? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah. I mean, I haven't seen this thing about the physics, which is interesting, but maybe it's a comfort blanket for us as, you know, as clinicians um, to have an extra implant in there because things do fail, you know, and it fails with the worst people at the worst time. And, you know, everything feels like it's closing in on you and um, it, it, it's quite stressful. So, um, you know, again, it, I probably don't have the science behind me for that, but it's just... Sometimes, you know, you know what works in your no, hands. No, I understand. It's just a thing, yeah. isn't it? You think, I had another one, I would get that. Situation. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's a I, thing. I, I think part of the problem is that a lot of the research done on implant loading is done uh, in vitro rather than in vivo, and it's done in Oxford for the with strain analysis and that. And body doesn't actually work like that, does it? Because we know that... We have to have enough bone around each individual implant to allow it to absorb the force that go there. If you put implants too close together, the reason they lose bone is that the bone is overstressed by the two implants moving together. The other problem we get is the bone density and quality lowers as we go. So those implants move more within bone the further back we go. But it, provided they're not too close together, six implants should withstand occlusal forces better than four implants. But then it's all down to the diameters of the implants and what we got. So it's very difficult to do a proper study in vivo, isn't it? Because every patient is different. And we've got that curve of normality. We don't know where the hell the patient is on that curve. Yeah. This is why both of his cases are all his cases are all on four, unless he's going to territory and saying that is. They are all on four. He hasn't demonstrated said I want you to do all the six. So is there a degree of proprioception? Although you don't get the same kind of appropriate sort of feeling as you do a T, you're still further away from the joints. You should put in sixes, you're putting things further back in general. So you normally stop around fives in main with, with all on four. I'm and sure I'm sure you'll go a little bit further back. Yeah, no, I'm sure I'm sure I'll be putting six in, I don't think I'll be going for four back and more in but this but this is was this was Mallow's yeah, uh, he was adamant that we shouldn't be putting any more. There is that. So, to, um, just to, sorry, go on. Yeah. Would you be talking about the inclusion on those cases that we've shown? So, for example, that lady, the professor. Yes. We, we have made a very nice, beautiful bridge at the top. But then I saw especially with her pay you. Her occlusion on the those bottom. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we've got a nice bridge from six to six to five. Yes. What, what you don't see is a couple of months later some more implants going in in the, in um, the lower jaw. In general, I'm asking this question that most often we see a patient comes, he or she has got a few teeth on the lower jaw, for example, five to five, and then the top jaw is rubbish. The teeth have to be replaced, for example, with all on four or six, whatever. But we only have that five to five on the lower jaw. And patients are going to use those five teeth, opposing teeth. How stable are they in plant breeding? How long is it likely to last with only five teeth? If it's a, in your example, she's only four teeth. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a definite risk. Um, there's always a, going to be a, a compromise about it. Uh, again, I quite like, again, using the mouth as an articulator, which sounds like a bit of a cop-out, but in terms of a series of temporary bridges, trying to um, almost reorganise the situation, okay, so that you know that the patient has got stability and then trying to reproduce that. 
So you know you can do things like custom guided pins on your articulators where they're set up on the articulator and you know you've got an occlusion that works with your temporizations and then you can actually sort of mold in the slides on that um, to, to try and reproduce what you know is, is working in the mouth. Now again, I'm no occlusion expert and I'm got a feeling you could probably take me apart on this one. So. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm not questioning your bridge. No, I'm, I'm questioning joking. the patient's opposing teeth because she very likely doesn't want a partially denture on the lower teeth. No, she doesn't. No. So therefore, we have ended up from five to five on the lower teeth jaw. Yeah. And then a very beautiful, nice function and very good bridge and implant bridge on the upper jaw. Yeah. So my question is how long her teeth will last? On the lower jaw. On the lower jaw, yeah. Because uh, uh, you've got porcelain against transplant. Porcelain against natural teeth, we know you're going to potentially get wear. She's a sort of stabilised perio case. Uh, she's well aware that, you know, her lower teeth, fortunately they're still there years later, and she has some posterior teeth. So at least she has a, a sort of stable occlusion with some posterior teeth. And again, so she's obviously ended up with some implants against implants, which is another lecture again on you know how you how you occlude implants together so yeah it's again i think everything is a compromise isn't it at some point so um again part of your consent process i get i think it comes down to the consent and sort of how you feel about it so what will do is you'll put two more implants in the six sites um so she's got six to six yeah and the seven. possibly maybe the you know it may maybe yeah. you can have that discussion with the patient i'm not when it's when it's sort of i've got ten in the low, opposing jaw, I'm probably not so worried. It's when it goes lower than that that I start to twitch a little bit, uh, and then we need to re-establish something back in there, uh, and then hopefully have the faith that they're going to do what we expect them to do, if that's a partial <coughs> denture, for instance. It's unusual that it's a partial denture if they're going for implants, because usually they want implants. Uh, but sometimes the anatomy won't let you put any more implants in. Uh, but it's a great question. Uh, I think if it's any less than sort of 10 teeth opposing, then that's where I start to twitch a little bit. What warranties do you give on the acrylic work? Or all the other... On, on the final work, so uh, it's five years on mine. Uh, I don't know what it is on Will's. I think it's uh, 18 months, isn't it? Yeah. Eight, eight months. Eight months. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll give five years, and then it's a, a, a sort of a going down a slope. So 100% first year, 80, 50, uh, 80, 20. The uh, third 95 yeah. lifetime guarantee. Yeah. yeah. So, what, what do you, what, so what do you mean by the percentage? So as, as the years go on, yeah. then the more the patient pays. Ah, right. okay. So we split that. So it's kind of like a, a descending warranty. Yeah. I've, got, I've got a sliding scale over five years, right. where after five years, you're kind of on your own. Yeah, really. You yeah. Know, in terms of financially, because, um, you know, case, case dependent, obviously. Um, you know, and I mean, what I mean by that is, you know, if you've got a patient that is a lovely little old lady that's come in and, you know, and, and so you can kind of change how you want it, but that is your warranty in there. And then it's up to you and how you, how you feel about yourself and whether you want to sleep at night as to whether you enforce the warranty or not. So as long as it's in there, as long as it's in, in the uh, consent, yeah. then you should be fine. What about loss of posterior support on the lower teeth, for example, where you've recommended they were going to have a... They were going to have wear lower dentures and didn't wear them at the back. There's no posterior oh. support. Give, give, me, give me a moment and I'll show you a case. Uh, and then I, it might answer your question <coughs> on, on what, what I do with that. Maybe. If not, bring it up again. Yeah, well, I'm conscious that we're, we're low on time. Um, part of the FG diploma relied heavily on looking at various evidence. And um, this is one of the papers that we had to do. Um, on, on failures, which admittedly is a little bit old. And I have to thank Nigel Jones, who would always spend time doing a script sheet and, and casting his keen eye over these papers, because as you know, a lot of papers are just absolute guff, really. Um, and really, just the things to pick out of, of this review is, is just obviously they're looking at biological and technical problems, looking at certain papers. Um, again, Nigel, keen eye as ever, noted these were carried out in academic institutions, maybe a little bit different from the sort of normal patients that, that we would see, and opposed by a full denture, which again is probably giving you, you know, maybe an easy ride. Technical complications are probably still going to be similar even in this day and age, aren't they? You might find that there's less material fracture of your prosthesis, 
um, with the new zirconias and things, which can be pretty bomb proof. But if it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. And then all those forces are getting transferred down into screw loosening and screw fracture. And again, the usual stuff, which you're going to see, of course, is, is the bone loss and the soft tissues, dehiscences. Um, and hyperplasia is quite a common one underneath these, um, underneath these bridges. So again, fill your boots, uh, all the research is out there, and tear it to pieces and appraise it. And the interesting thing was that they said there was 90% survival of the implants and something like 87% of the superstructures, but 98% of cases had minor complications yeah. over 10 years. Huge so, so everybody yeah, has everybody. complications. Yeah. Um, and I, I just put these sort of last two up to show you what unique sort of situations you can end up with. So the one on the left, the lovely leg on the left roof, uh, she had her provisional and we made her her final. And um, she didn't like the final because it was too thin. So she liked the provisional because it was slightly thicker. So what we had to do was get the provisional made, um, sorry, get the final made thicker like the provisional. So we had to do a copy of that. And then she was over the moon with that. So we kind of had to go back a stage. And it was quite difficult to kind of figure out what it was that she did and didn't like at first because we thought it was an aesthetic issue, but actually it was just the thickness of the appliance. So we're busy thinking that they want it thinner and a little bit more room, and sometimes they don't. So they don't come there. She told me, eventually, <laughs> eventually. Right. Uh, took them off, basically, because we keep the uh, we keep the, the first appliance. Yeah. And she goes, I want, it, I want it like that. that if, when, as soon as she said that, it's like, right, we get you. Right. And then the guy on the other side uh, should have been alarm bells, really. So had his implants placed, had his provisional placed, came back in, did the workup, and then never saw him again. So he's out in the ether somewhere, and that guaranteed that we were sort of talking about, uh, it's kind of gone, really. And it goes if they don't fulfill the last side of the bargain. And that can be for the next slide, if we talk about it, the, the maintenance process that we go through. If they don't fulfill this side of the bargain, again, that goes into their notes, then we're not going to guarantee the appliance. So they have to tick that apart, and they have to be on board with how we're looking at it. So this is one um, that I got from Andy, who works over at uh, Colin Campbell's clinic. and. I mean, we're doing the same, so it's at least, at least to be 12 months earlier. We talked a little bit about the perio patients, so we're getting those in a little bit more frequently. Radiographs, if there's bleeding, 12, 24 months. So if there's bleeding, we need to sort of figure out what's going on, what is it that we need to sort out. Is it the patient's cleaning? Is it some kind of peri-implantitis, whatever reason, to figure that out. Um, don't always remove the appliance, so we keep it to a minimum now. So we used to take it off every single time they came in. Um, but some of the evidence out there is suggesting that the breaking that seal, even though it's the appliance on the abutment, could potentially learn, get some ingress of bacteria around those abutments. So maybe leaving that appliance on. Um, and so far, that's what we've been doing. And um, so far, so good. We haven't had many issues, get the odd issues. Uh, that's so are you taking the appliance off then now? After, after sort of about 12 months, I'll take it off. And then every couple of years after that, if I'm happy with everything, so I'll take it off. Yeah, and then a uh, hygienist and just a, a little sort of clean around. It's like, almost like a profi yeah. around bleeding, then that changes the way. It's like perio. <coughs> Treat it like perio. So you get more aggressive, the more aggressive problems that you get. So that kind of uh, sums it up. I want to thank you all for your time. Really grateful for allowing us to yatter on about our experiences with the oh, Thanks for the questions. They were yeah. almost bang on, weren't they? They kind of led into, into everything. So yeah. your, your participation was really appreciated. Thank yeah, you. Phil, David, Lloyd, thank you very much for inviting us up to do the talk. And uh, really appreciate all your time. Thank you so much, Nigel. Thank you very much. <laughs>
uh, to the table. So I think sometimes we tend to attract certain patients um, that know, uh, and I don't intend to, to do it because um, I just don't have the, ex I'm old, I just want to go home. Yeah. <laughs> go home, sleep. Yeah. Older than I look. And you'll come back and talk about failing in the last two Of course. Yeah. 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 And, and I think pleasure. We're, we're, we're comfortable with Society. failing implants. Yeah. Failing zygomatics, I wouldn't know how to deal with. I, I just don't have that. And you've got to assume you're going to have failing zygomatics. So. Well, probably the best pair of hands we've seen in our travels was Tiziano Testori, yes. who is just oh, yeah. a genius yeah. surgeon. And he says, I'm not going anywhere near zygomatics, because when those get infected, you're in, it, it can be life threatening. So, uh, why would you go there? So, he's a, he's what? You're, you're talking about psychological assessment. My wife has given me three rules never treat anyone who cries at the assessment. You know, if anyone breaks into tears, they're not psychologically stable. Don't do that. Anyone who is everyone else's fault, don't treat them. And everyone who wonders if you can just do it a little bit cheaper. And then the thing on guarantees on lifetimes. Um, we had a, a tutor at the London Hospital, Ziggy, and Ziggy was the sort of person you took things to if you weren't quite sure about it. You'd say, "Oh, my dear, Mr. Jones has done a lovely job for you. Make a lovely dentist one day, Mr. Jones." Well, and then he did some demonstration dentures for us as a, a demonstration case, partial dentures. And the lady came back for. Um, her assessment, and he said, how are you getting on, my dear? She said, well, I'm a bit disappointed, Mr. Zegloff. You said uh, these would last a lifetime, and two of the teeth have fallen off. He said, yes, that was its lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. I like that. So, sorry, one more question there, is it? Yeah. Sorry, why is the prosthetic heart valve is a contraindication? Because a lot of literature say that don't do it before six months after they have placed the heart valve, prosthetic heart valve. But you said if there is a prosthetic heart valve, it's a contraindication. Yeah, it is for me. Um, yeah, uh, it's just how I sort of feel about things. I'm, I'm just not prepared to take the risk. Then uh, my second question would be to you. So would you look at the people with a heart murmur and a defect heart valve and a leaking heart valve the same way? Not necessarily. Um, so I've done quite a lot of the research on this um, and the evidence isn't fantastic. So again, it's a little bit grey. It's a little bit like, um, so I come from, so let me tell you where my background is, it might help a little bit. So I come from a mycological background before I did dentistry. And then I came into dentistry, and, and no offence, but you guys were given antibiotics before you probably qualify for all sorts of things. And I'm thinking, what the hell are you guys doing? You've given antibiotics for this, you've given antibiotics. And the evidence was really poor. And then it changed, and we had the new evidence come up, and antibiotics were kind of a, a bit of a no-no for certain cases, and it made a bit more sense to me from a micrological point of view. And now you see this kind of switch back where antibiotics are being prescribed for certain patients. So there's this, there's this sort of slight area where the evidence is a little bit grey and the evidence that was originally based was really poor. Basically what they did is they did some research and the body that was looking at the research sort of said, oh, what are we going to do about dentists? And they just went, tell them to give antibiotics. And that was the decision by the working party. There was no evidence at all about how dentistry came into fit with the patients that were having the heart valve replacements or anything like that. Now, and this was sort of about 25, maybe 30 years ago, that working party, now we've got a little bit more basic evidence, we can kind of look at which patients actually do sort of respond and don't respond, and which ones need it and which ones don't need it. So for that's where I kind of get my sort of evidence from, if you like, and my understanding behind it. So I'm not particularly worried about those patients that have a murmur, but I am a little bit more concerned about the patient who has a heart valve replacement. That doesn't, does that answer your question or? You don't have to, you do what you, do what, you, do what you like. Look at the literature, they all, I mean, most of them saying that don't do it before six months after placement of yeah. the uh, prosthetic heart valve. It does not say that it's a contraindication. Yeah, well, I mean, that's if, if you're comfortable with it, you, I'm not comfortable with it. I've, I've, got, I've got a concern about it. Per me, person. Have you got patients that you want to need to treat? Have you had a, well, I've not had it. Okay. okay. <laughs>
Good. Well, we'll uh, leave that. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, one more back there. Yeah, yeah quite a lot of uh, patients, they ask, after having implants, if they could take any, if there's anything they would recommend for them to take, um, like vitamin D's, or there's loads of stuff you can buy in Orange and Barrett now for bones. And I don't know, is there any evidence of anything? So, is this specifically vitamin D, is it helpful or not? Is that right? Sorry? Is this. Is the, is the question specifically about vitamin D, or is it about no, no, what you give in, after? I think there was, there was somebody mentioned some chondroid, some other stuff. Chondroitin. There, some, uh, but yeah. Yeah. There's quite a few stuff out there. Yeah, I, again, um, I don't know any systematic research papers that would sort of suggest it's a good or a bad thing. I think if the patients want to take it, then by all means let them take it. I don't see that it's going to do any harm. It may do some benefit, but if you'd like to do some research on it, um, there's probably a gap in the, pa in the market there for it. Uh, if the patient came and said that's what they want to do, I wouldn't have an issue, would it? Would it be something I recommend? Not necessarily. Um, there's quite a lot of anecdotes about it. Yeah. Isn't Again, from Facebook and Instagram, there's a lot of chat. Yeah, so from an evidence... It's just going to be anecdotal, isn't it? Yeah, an evidence point of view, the research just isn't out there. But from a, a kind of, like I said earlier, a little bit about how your gut kind of feels, well, it kind of adds up, doesn't it, that it might work a little bit? It's like collagen as well. You can yeah. Use it. it's like mm. it's so this is kind of how things kind of happen and they develop. So we kind of make a, a connection and then we run with that connection and then it gets taken up and then somebody actually goes and does some meaty research after a bit of time. And then somebody asks us some more research and somebody asks us some more research and then somebody comes along who's lazy and takes those research papers and does a systematic review and says, oh, actually, they're all right or they're all wrong. And we end up where we are. A consultant dermatologist a few weeks ago told me that if you take a vitamin D, it's got to be in oil form because you won't absorb it if it's water-based. So it's got to be oil-based. Yeah. Yeah. Throw that worth the price of admission on it. <laughs> Good. We're going to go and uh, have some lunch. We need to be back here at two o'clock. Okay. So have some lunch. You'll notice Phil Mathers doesn't drink coffee at lunchtime because it keeps him awake in the afternoon. So. Uh...